Well, it's been a while, everyone. Welcome. Uh, time for another director's commentary, as you likely already read in the title. I am actually, it's going to be an interesting one for me because I've, what I want to do is I actually want to walk through all of the Survivor Man Bigfoot shows that I did. That's what I'm going to do next for director's commentaries, and then I will get right back to doing all of the Survivor Man episodes as well. It's been a while since I've done this. Uh, the reason is that right now, uh, Travel Channel in the United States is airing Survivor Man Bigfoot, and uh, apparently there's uh, quite a bit of interest going on. So I thought, okay, let's, um, let's tackle it right now. Hopefully I've got enough power, 80% left in the uh, laptop, and I am way up north. And the other, this is the other reason why this is uh, going to be a bit of an interesting one for me. It's because I am actually up in northern Ontario in a very small little cabin uh, in a place where I've had some strange experiences. Uh, so related, to, obviously, to the phenomenon of Sasquatch, Bigfoot, or not related at all. Maybe it was just moose and bear. I don't know. But there's been some weird stuff happen here. So I thought, well, I'm up here right now, uh, just sort of cleaning up the cabin and opening things up for the season. And I thought, what a great place and time to do another director's commentary, this time on a Bigfoot episode. I went looking to see what I actually had in my hard drives, and I found the episode that I shot down in uh, Willow Creek, the Hoopa Territory, which is the area where the famous Patty film comes from. In fact, uh, Max and I, the, my cameraman, Max Atwood and I, we actually walked down right to the spot where they filmed the, the, the Bigfoot that is actually, if you don't know this, is nicknamed Patty. Uh, which, by the way, also, if you don't know, th know this, is apparently a female. Now, right now, I've got people watching me going, it's a hoax, it's crap, it's bullshit. And uh, they're talking about that. They're saying, oh, this crap, I can't believe you fell for that crap. Oh, why are you, st I can't believe you went and hung out with Broad Standing. Uh, oh, the Bigfoot film from Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin is a bunch of crap. It was a guy, I know a guy, and you get that, eh? Like, this, like, no, no, my uncle knew a guy who knew a guy who said he has the suit. Okay. Excellent. Well, regardless of all of that, and regardless of the fact that some of you are also going to put on the posts, too much talking. So this is too much talking during a director's commentary. Okay, so for those of you who need a little help, this is a director's commentary, meaning I'm going to be talking my way through the film. If you want to watch the whole film, just head on over to the playlist, Survivor Man Bigfoot, and have a watch. Then you can watch the whole film as it is without my annoying voice interrupting you. Okay, shall we get started? Ah, doing this all by candlelight, with the exception of the laptop. Let's see. Oh, it doesn't affect me too much. Good. Kind of wanted you to get into the ambiance here of this. There's no electricity in this cabin. There's no running water. There's no solar power. Uh, it's just candles and um, a propane stove and a wood stove for heat. And that's it. And whatever's going on out around me, who knows? And outside is the amazing northern Ontario woods. Again, smack dab in the middle of an area where I've had some kind of freaky experiences. That's all I'm going to say till another time about what's going on around this cabin because I want to get to the Hoopa story. But uh, suffice it to say, it's very dark out there and I'm alone. Feels like deja vu for me when you think about it, but... All right, shall we get started? This is what I get to look at first. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you an important message. Oh, shut up. Let's just scan it right ahead. Past the credits, the opening slate. There we go. And a one, two, three, go. Well... Oh. If there's ever a time to have a Bigfoot encounter, it could be right now. This is creepy. You can see what I can see, which is not much. Because we're in the dark, pretty much almost. I'm walking in a 
thick, thick blanket of fog. I mean, it doesn't get any better than this. Beware the moors and stick to the road. Haha! <laughs> I love throwing in uh, random uh, pop culture references to see who gets them. You know what that one's from? Uh, you can you can put it in the uh, in the comments there. Uh, and a quick comment on what I was seeing there. That's one of the things that's always a little bit difficult when you're filming out in the dark. And I want to point something out here. You go back and watch the Survivor Man series. Until I was dealing with the necessity of filming myself alone and filming myself in the dark as much as I had to, you don't see hardly any, if any, night shot, night shot camera viewpoint until Survivor Man came along. Now, let me explain why. It's kind of an industry sort of thing. Uh, when I started using the bells and whistles attached to the smaller cameras, I needed the smaller consumer type cameras to shoot Survivor Man. When I started using the bells and whistles that were, whistles that were attached to the camera, like time lapse or night shot, well, the real cameraman, of course, I was a real cameraman before that. I worked with all the bigger cameras and everything. But the real cameramen, they would turn up their nose at what they saw as the consumer bells and whistles. And so they were trying to do night shot with weird other ways and trying to light something for night and the rest. Of it. And they, you know, they just despised uh, time lapse uh, used in a consumer camera, prosumer camera, or, a, uh, or, or night shot. But I found it as a, it was a perfect way to actually tell my story. I didn't care about the technology. I had a story to tell. And so I used those bells and whistles. And you can look back from that and see where a lot of shows changed their methodology with the camera gear post Survivor Man. That's all I'm saying. This is really interesting. I must be looking at a really old version that I have because see, that's not that's not the opening you're seeing. That's uh, that's the Survivor Man opening, which this all got changed into Survivor Man Bigfoot. Maybe it's just in there for the timing. I wonder what cut this is. This would be interesting. This is the Hoopa Native Territory situated amidst beautiful, rugged wilderness and home to the legend of Bigfoot. Northwest California is famous or infamous, depending on how you look at it, but not for movie stars or musicians, rather for its abundance of Bigfoot sightings. It's the location where Roger Patterson shot his controversial film footage of a Bigfoot, a claim he stood by until his death, and a claim that his partner in the event, Bob Gimlin, still stands behind today. I'll just stop right there. Um... Yeah, God, you could, that's that's such an amazing little town to go. I think Willow Creek. I think that was it. Willow Bluff, Willow Creek. Anyway, it's uh, it's just they 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 did the right thing, man. They they just said, okay, if everybody thinks Bigfoot comes from here, let's just jump on it. And there's a big mural on the side of the barn there that has Bigfoot like kind of working off to the side with the loggers, that sort of thing. Uh, and I bought some Bigfoot red wine there. Oh, one taste, and then I. Sorry, guys, but. I dumped it on the ground. It was horrid. I don't know. It's probably sitting on a shelf way too warm. Maybe it was good when it got bottled. I don't know, but oh my God. It wasn't even fit to cook with. So, word to the wise. If you see a bottle with Bigfoot Red on it, be careful. It might not be to your liking. All right. Let's just keep watching. Okay. This is it. This is the place. 1967. A film was shot here. Just a few seconds of film footage. Set the world afire spiraled down a road of controversy that's still going strong today. Roger Patterson went to his grave swearing by it. Bob so in this situation right here, you can see that someone is filming me. With the Survivor Man Bigfoot, I, there was no claims or, of being alone or even worrying about being alone. I didn't need to be alone. I was doing something else. I was doing a series based on the phenomenon of Bigfoot. So it wasn't Survivor Man. Um, and so Max Atwood, who worked on Survivor Man getting like the beauty shots, the birds and the bees and the gorgeous sunrises and time lapses while I would be out doing my seven days. Well, he came along on the Bigfoot shoots, many of them anyway, 
and uh, this time he can be there and he can shoot me. So we walk down, it's a seven mile walk down a dirt road, it's a pretty steep, steep downhill all the way down to the spot uh, where I guess we have it right here, where this film was taken. Gimlin is still with us and he still holds that it was true that he stood there with Roger Patterson while he filmed that big hairy creature. We come up the creek, Roger in front of me. Crick. Come around this big downfall tree, and the creature was standing just about 30 or 40 feet on the, uh, on the other side of the creek. And so Roger's running across the creek trying to get focus. And my first thought was, yeah, these things really do exist. And then Roger runs across the creek, and he stumbled and fell down. Then he jumps up and runs over to a log and gets his elbows down on the log and starts stabilizing himself to get a better picture. I'm just going to stop it right there and say that this is actually the first time that the, that, uh, the pre-footage has ever been used. People never show the pre-footage and I wanted to show that early footage. We only ever see those few seconds when the creature, if you will, is walking. But there was, you saw them on the horse there and so there was this whole lead up to uh, what was actually going on there. And I don't know why no one else has ever shown it. Um, I did speak with, um, I guess it was Mrs. Patterson, and uh, got, got the, uh, the, the permission and the rights to, to utilize it. And uh, I thought it was thrilling to be able to show something that uh, no one had ever seen before, actually. This is obviously Bob speaking to me. We went and we met with him. Real nice man, uh, had a great time. He's a, he's a cowboy. Uh, and he's still alive and doing well and I hope lives a very good long life and still stands behind this story. Uh, so call him a fraud if you want. Call him anything you want. He doesn't care. He knows what he saw and is, as the saying goes, that's his story and he's sticking to it. I see this thing walking slow but it's covering a lot of ground quickly. She got quite a little ways up there and I, I said, well, uh, Roger, I want to follow her. And he said, don't, he said, don't leave me here. And then he tells me later why, because the, the three different sizes of tracks down there, and he thought that the other two might be right there. Well, I wasn't thinking about the other two or nothing. I just wanted to see this thing again to make sure, you know, to make sure I knew what I was seeing. There's two things here. Classic. Either they're telling the truth or it's a hoax. There's no in between. It's one or the other. I've had my strange and weird occurrences out here, but I've seen nothing that I can claim is a Bigfoot. I've only heard some strange things that I cannot explain. And that keeps me digging deeper. I'm not here on behalf of Roger and Bob. I'm here on behalf of my own curiosity. What the heck have I heard when I've been out in the wilderness on so many different occasions? When I want answers, I go after them. And the answers are out here. The native residents of the town of Hoopa have been extremely gracious in allowing me to film in their area. I'm just going to stop that right there. By the way, I also see some posts. Ah, oh, seems like I annoy a lot of you guys. I don't know, but I see some posts going, why is he always going to talk with that dramatic voice? It's filmmaking. It's fun. It's, it's you know, every time I've done a series, I've gone into the, uh, the uh, vocal booth to do my narration, and I kind of pick a different voice. Why? To go with the flow of the story I'm telling. So with, um, funnily enough, with Survivor Man, uh, I needed to kind of capture the same voice I had when I was out there. You know what I used to do? Go into the vocal booth and scream into a pillow till I blew up my voice, then read my narration. And that way I had that rough, area voice. And don't sound as nasally as I sound right now. Uh, with Bigfoot, my whole idea behind how I narrated Bigfoot was I wanted to... I wanted to be whispering in your ear. Uh, I wanted to be really close to you and, and speaking like this because it's an interesting phenomenon and we're kind of, I think this kind of sound was going to work. And for Beyond Survival, it was a different uh, tone altogether. So there. They understand that I come here with deep respect for their traditional and spiritual belief systems. Up here, everyone takes it for granted. Nobody, nobody doubts its existence up here. They all just, it's here. They've all had their experiences, and if they haven't, their aunt has, their cousin has, their uncle has. Somebody's had some kind of experience that they believe of a sighting of a big, walking, hairy beast. 
And isn't it interesting that there are so many other towns, you have the same thing. Clem 2 is exactly the same way. They don't care what you think, but almost everybody has some kind of crazy experience or their aunt or their uncle or their mom or their dad or their sister or their brother uh, to do with this phenomenon. And uh, it's, I don't want to say creepy. Let's just say it's compelling when you, when you get into these small towns and you see the people's faces in their eyes and they have nothing to gain from you. And they just say, hey, you know, this is my story. Take it or leave it. For a long time, I was like, I didn't want to really talk about it. Didn't tell anybody because I didn't want them to think I was crazy or nothing. As I dropped down right here, I turned on my high beams when it caught my eye. And by the time I actually got my car to it, it was already over and then going down. My cousin came back the next day to look for any kind of prints or any kind of things he can see because I was pretty freaked out about what I saw. I don't like to be in the woods at night. Not because I'm, I just, no. Yeah, I said, what do you do with that, something like that? She says what she saw, she saw. And maybe I'll do this here and now. Here's the way you have to look at something like that. Let's just say that um, the person that is telling you they have some sort of crazy experience is a conservation officer. Get lots of those. And they're a teetotaler. Hmm. So they say, oh, I was out there on the trail, 15 feet away, 10 foot tall, hairy dude, you know, and then he walked off the trail and, and left me there. And this person is like a nose bears inside and out, knows what a wolf looks like or a moose looks like, what they sound like, all of that. And, you know, maybe it's, it's your, your uncle or something. And, and then I've heard people say, yeah, my uncle said this. And then, and then they'll follow it up with something like, yeah, but I don't know. And I always want to stop you right there and go, what do you mean you don't know? Well, I mean, come on. I, I don't know if I believe it. Okay, so then let's call up your conservationer, conservationist, uh, uh, conservation officer, teetotaler, uncle. Tell him he's a freaking liar. Oh, don't say that about me. Well, you just said you don't know. He, he wasn't high. He wasn't drunk. Can't be mistaken identity. He knows his animals. Now, one of the comebacks is, well, it's delusion. You can't argue the delusion thing. I've said this commentary before, by the way, in other Bigfoot uh, commentary, director's commentaries. You can't argue the, the delusional thing because when someone says you're delusional, the, the argument's over. There's nothing to discuss. They're not, they're not going to see anything else other than you're delusional. So I guess tens of thousands of people and hundreds of uh, indigenous cultures are all delusional. Okay, so fine. We have to take that delusional comment and put it on the shelf. You can't really answer that one. If somebody thinks you're delusional, that's the end of the story. So, mistaken identity? Nope. Um, high or drunk? Nope. Delusional? Put that on the shelf. And, uh, you know, you're, what are you left with? Well, they're either lying or they're giving you an ac accurate representation of what they saw. It's one or the other. There's no in between. They're either lying or they're telling the truth. And they saw what they saw. And so you have to step back and go, but there's hundreds of them or thousands of them and then these indigenous cultures as well. And, well, okay. Well, then either they're all lying uh, or something's going on out there. Don't go into the woods at night. The shadow men will get you. That's what many native cultures have taught their children. Is there real substance behind the warning? Or is it just a scare tactic to get their kids home at night? It's pouring down. It's calling for a lot of heavy rain over the next few days. And I'm just trying to go in deep into the forest. That's, that's not good. <laughs> Basically, I'm just going to take myself down these, uh, these access roads for uh, a few miles. I gotta, I gotta get in deep into the forest and start to put myself in the path of potential interaction with something. At the very least, this is some of the densest black bear habitat in California. A lot of commentary about, uh, you know, if you put a map up of black bear ter territory and a map up of uh, Bigfoot sightings, they just mirror each other, you know, perfectly. Uh, same thing for, uh, uh, what am I looking for? Not rainfall, but uh, I guess rainfall. Same thing for rainfall. If you look at a rainfall chart in North America and a Bigfoot sighting chart in North America, they tee up. 
uh, with a certain level of rainfall. And, uh, oh, where was I? Oh, yeah. And the other thing that you hear an awful lot is nothing ever happens when it's raining. It's been true for me, too. When I've been out there and it's been raining, nothing ever happens. Maybe they don't like the rain. I don't know. It'd be interesting. Okay, so here, this is what I know to be much more classic bear scat. It's obvious as soon as I see it. What's interesting here is that right beside it, there's a small bit of scat. It's different, different consistency, different color. And then this big bear scat here. Which one came first? I don't know. But usually in cases like this, it's, it is, it's all territory marking. Someone goes poop in one spot, someone else comes along and goes, okay, well, I'm gonna poop on the other side of that log, and there you go, it's, uh, we, can, we can share this area, or I'm just letting you know I'm here. So that's definitely two different types of scat side by side, and I'm quite confident the, the large pile is, is bear scat. You know, you want to track anything in the wilderness, start learning how to track animals. It's one of the best, most fun, most exciting things. And being able to determine, to determine the age of a track is always one of my, the most important things, I think, including if you find scat, poop. Uh, you can you know, be able to determine its age once you start paying attention. And, uh, you know, for example, if it's steaming, that bear's pretty close. I don't know what the other pile is. It's not mine. Pretty sure Max had a lot of fun filming this. Yeah, it's coming along the road here. Except for the rain. Already to see tracks, I mean. Hard to tell. I mean, whenever they're kind of big and toe print like, they become suspicious, right? It's like, okay, well. Got to be bear tracks, of course, you'd think, but then you don't see any claw marks. It just gets weird. There's a track here. The thing is, like, there's one track down there, and the next track is, is six, seven feet away. And that's a definite track. <laughs> ah, wow. I, I hate how my own imagination gets to me in these times, but I mean, I can see what looks like toe prints. Power of suggestion. I do not see any claw prints. Got to be careful. Like a, you know, the front part of a foot digging as you go up the hill. One of the indicators that a track may have been made by a Sasquatch is the distance between the strides. It's often as long as five to seven feet. That's key, right? However, if it's in the snow, is it something huge and bipedal making seven foot spans as it walks? Or is it a rabbit, snowshoe hare? Jumping. Got to know your tracks. The thing about this forest I find interesting is, at least in some spots, travel through it. It's not all that difficult. It's lots of Let's face it. Anytime I, I've got to shoot something to do with survival or or the phenomenon of Bigfoot, if the forest is wet and misty, kind of adds to the ambiance. Big spaces between the trees, flat ground. Something about this forest, I can say, seems to affect your psyche, though. I mean, just it just, it's felt weird being here ever since the day I showed up. It just felt weird. But feelings. Oh, I'm, I was just about to say, but feelings aren't facts, and I do say it. Aren't facts, although they might be indicators. Just what do they indicate? That's the mystery. What the heck? Oh, I think I can tell. You see, now check this out in terms of the power of suggestion. So we know why I'm out here, right? I see this tree, and look at the way the, the limbs are gouged and, and broken off. I looked over here, look at this. It's the same thing again. Limbs all broken off to the very same height. Instantly, I know that, that Bigfoot researchers are looking at us saying, that's a sign, that's, that's definitely, you know, a Sasquatch breaking limbs, maybe even ticked off. But then, I step back a bit, look at the big picture a little bit, and you know what I notice is that along the road, 
There's a swath, and it swoops right along there, and then goes back out on the road. And to me, that could simply tell the story of there was a big truck here. It was muckier than he thought it was going to be, so he gunned it. And as he gunned it, it was like crack, bash, bash, crack, break. And then the next tree, same thing. And then, oh, back up on the road. So you see, there are many answers to strange-looking things. And that's the key here. And that's what I have done with all of the Survivor Man Bigfoot episodes, is say, let's just stay, if, if not a skeptic, but certainly a skeptic, an open-minded skeptic, let's just try to look at everything with wide open eyes and go, wait a minute, okay, what else could it be that is normal that we know of, but either human or bear or moose or wolf or what have you? What else could it be? And if you come up with serious answers of what else it could be, well, then, you know, you don't have much other than, yeah, it was probably a truck that came along and skidded in the mud and knocked those branches off all at the same size. And I'm, I'm suggesting that is exactly what was going on there. But I like to show that out so that if, the, if you do see something that you can't explain, now you've got something. Max, my second camera operator, usually leaves me alone for these treks but he's joined me to help increase our chances of filming whatever might be out here. And before we get far, we spot what is considered to be by many a sign of Sasquatch. All right, well, I gotta do it. I gotta stop and look at this. Huh. Ah, uh, the only tree break. Again. Oh, nice cut right there. Gotta hand it over to Barry Farrell, my editor, for knowing exactly when to cut something dramatically. And we're back. Hiking on the back roads of Northwest California, Max and I are off looking for signs of Sasquatch. And it doesn't take long. So that's what's called a, uh, uh, oh, what is it called? God, I must be tired. All this fresh air. Uh, in any event, when you come back from commercial and you show what happened before, before the break kind of thing, I will tell you something, when you see television shows that do that a lot, like coming up next and you get 30 seconds and then you come back in the commercial, before the commercial and you get like another 30, 60 seconds, that's the sign of a lazy producer, a lazy director. When you, I, I, I don't really like doing that. I actually had to put that in after an argument with the network and I kept it very short and very minimal because your content should already be great enough, powerful enough that you don't need to tease everybody of what's coming or relive what just happened before the commercial break. It should, it should be a, a trajectory that is rolling and, and people just can't stop watching. That's the sign of a good film producer. Anyway, just my opinion. Tree break. This tree is broken off exactly the same way so many others have been. Ah, the tree breaks. There's nothing on the ground here to indicate a log or a little so dead branch coming down. Could be a tree from above. break. Tree right beside it is unaffected. Would a human have done this? Not for what purpose? A trapper? There's none here. Roads department? No. Snow load? Well, this happened this summer. This did not happen throughout the winter last winter. This happened very recently. You know, there is another possibility of that tree break there. Hoaxing. Somebody doing it for fun. Somebody watching a lot of TV and reading up and hearing about things like tree breaks and saying, hey, let's break some trees. I mean, my prediction is that, you know, fake tracks and tree breaks and tree structures are going to start occurring all over the place, which is unfortunate. Yeah, you know, I think if you were looking at <coughs> video footage from several years ago, the, 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 the motivation wasn't there to hoax by so many. But after finding Bigfoot, uh, which just turned it, you know, the whole phenomenon into a cultural punchline, uh, it became a thing. So if you're around a park around Los Angeles, Topanga Canyon or someplace like that, it's pretty hard to think of anything. You see tracks and stuff like that. It, what, when it becomes special is when you do a fly-in fishing trip to northern Quebec and you land on a lake and you get out and, uh, and there's... 18 inch barefoot tracks with six foot spans just in the middle of nowhere. Okay, nobody went up there 
to put those tracks in the sand, like a scene from the movie Help by the Beatles, just to hoax you. Okay, uh, Those tracks you're finding in the middle of nowhere are real tracks. What they are is up for debate, but the fact of the matter is they aren't going to be hoaxing tracks uh, when you really are in the middle of nowhere. Who, who's got the time or the patience or the energy to go way out in the middle of nowhere to put some tracks in hidden areas by the one in you know, 10 million chance that someone might come upon them and, and think that they're real? So when you find those strange tracks or weird things happen out in the middle of nowhere, that's the stuff you want to pay attention to. Not so much you know, in a main camping area of Algonquin Park or Golden Ears Park or Topanga Canyon or Glacier National Park. Not, not, not there. No, you want to be way out there. Because it'll make a mockery and a joke of the subject matter more than it seems to already be, which for wildlife biologists who want to be involved in serious research on the potential of just such a species, it just makes everything really difficult. Even I myself, I'm not ever going on record right now and saying I believe in Bigfoot or I know they exist. I don't. I've never seen one. But I've had some very strange experiences. And without, you know, delving into all kinds of crazy theories, the closest thing that I can imagine that's affected me is potentially this, this species. That's why I'm out here. I just want to dig deeper and find out. I called it species. I wish I'd said phenomenon because uh, that's how I refer to it now. It's a phenomenon. It truly is. Real or not, imagined or not, delusional or not, fake and hoaxed or not, either way, it's quite the phenomenon. And that's what has me intrigued. But how deep does the rabbit hole go? The scientists should at least be interested because the potential is that if it exists at all, this is a species closest to our own. It can be a legitimate area of study. Even if it is mythology, where does the mythology come from? Because unicorns and fairies don't leave tracks in the mud or knock on trees. Just standing. Yeah, you know, that's the thing, eh? Science. Huh. I mean, how, how, imagine people like Jeff Meldrum, John Bindernagel, uh, rest in peace, you know, so many different scientists, they so frustrated that their peers won't even give this the time of day. And when you have hundreds of encounters with traditional Aboriginal indigenous cultures to start with, and then thousands of anecdotal references, you still got to go, well, at least debunk it, you know? Isn't the point of science to ask what, why, how, and just say okay to checking something out? Uh, thankfully, I'm not a scientist, so I don't feel that peer pressure at all. I could care less. That's all I got to say. Going over the map, making sure. Uh, I miss, this is a road here. I don't want to miss the trail. I've got to head off on the right on it. Clear and distinct. Tree knock really loud. I clearly heard it. It wasn't just a... Oh, I forgot that happened here. Know, a tree limb moving or something. It was, a, it was like a... You guys keep watching. I need more wine. In the woods which could mean absolutely nothing. What's needed is a systematic study of the evidence for the real story to emerge. I mean, it's just really strange, given all the information that I've been given over the time, to find these. And in this case, you've got one going one way and one going the other way. Like they're, they're beside each other and they're both broken in separate directions. You know, if it's snow load or a big windstorm, they're always going to be, everything's going to be all in the same direction. So let's, let's approach this whole tree breaking thing. Uh, originally, you know, Todd Standing showed me so many tree breaks and that's how I sort of got into it that way. Other people talk about it as well. Um, and again, whether or not you believe, uh, Todd Standing's word for anything, that's, that's up to you. I don't, I don't really care. Uh, all I know is the concept of the tree breaks, what was fascinating about it was simply that Aboriginal cultures used breaking trees to communicate. You know, indigenous cultures would, would uh, First Nations people would, would 
break trees in certain ways to say, we came this way, we're going to the big lake, you know, that kind of thing. It was very, very simple communication. Uh, that's what makes it so intriguing that, you know, if there were a species that lived entirely in the forest and was incredibly intelligent, incredibly stealthy, and but was in, you know, would communicate, that would be a way to do it. I've done it myself with people say, you know, you leave a log a certain way. So the tree break thing remains fascinating because it also could be just snow load. It could be what trappers do or snowmobilers do. Uh, there are lots of other explanations for it. It's when you find them consistently in a place that's way out there in a, in a kind of break format that just seems too perfect to be random, you know, brought on by weather or snow. Although, mini cyclones, it's a tricky one. Fun though. That's not the case. If I take anything from what other researchers have told me, that's supposed to mean you're not welcome anywhere here. Stay out. Or, Maybe I'm welcome everywhere. Maybe it means that. This would be prime, prime time to happen upon any kind of larger wildlife. Thick, thick mist everywhere, the rain, so the, the, my scent is down, there's no wind. And uh, when I head out of here, it's going to be pretty much uh, a good part of the way in the dark. That's one of the things, you know, if you're seeking an interaction, with a larger, especially predator, the more vulnerable you make yourself, the more vulnerable you are because of the weather, the sounds, the smells, the wind and everything, the more likely that they're going to be interested in you, interested in you and, and come in close. Uh, that's the crazy thing about some of this, especially the phenomenon of Sasquatch is you have to kind of make yourself very vulnerable. That's something that I did way over in Radium Springs when I shot over, was it Radium Springs? No, Nordegg. Alberta, when I shot over there, made myself incredibly vulnerable. As a survival instructor, didn't like it. Didn't like it. It went against every, you know, sense in my body of how to survive a situation. You don't make yourself vulnerable. You, you want to have the upper hand. Certainly when you're in an area where there's large uh, mountain lions, cougars, there's large black bear, wolf packs. You, you don't want to be in a vulnerable place. And yet, if you want to seek out an encounter, that's... That's what you do. You become vulnerable. It's, yeah. It's, it takes some cojones. Let's just say that. That'll be interesting. As I trek further along the back roads of the Hoopa territory, further signs of activity catch my attention. So, I mean, this is even curious. This, uh, I mean, I guess it's a kind of a willow tree. It's uh, all bent over here. Yeah, so when you find those branches have been random bendovers, and... it's like, why is this it one tree pulled over? Was it? It's, it's not, it didn't just do this on its own. And then if you look at the bottom, all of the branches at the bottom have been been chewed, and like all of the the leaves. Now it's well known that this is a tree that is good for headaches to eat. I mean, perhaps if one were to conjecture on the wild side, one could say, well, something had a headache and wanted to eat the willow shoots, or just wanted to eat the willow shoots, period. Pulled this tree down and nibbled away. Which, by the way, a bear could do. Nibbled away, and nibbled away, just kept it in. But what in an area like this would do that? Moose do it all the time. That's just so nice. It's getting weirder and weirder here. There's another tree. It's come down, but it's broken right off, so. You know, maybe, maybe just a big, big storm. Oh, see, there's a tree break right here. That's, that's fresh, right? See that tree break there? That's super fresh. That's not very long ago at all. And it's got the classic formation of being a tree break. And it's, it's the size of a tree that, that I'm not going to be able to do with my bare hands, nor any other man. And yet how it would have just come down on its own like that. I mean, it does not make any sense. And it's, uh, again, pointed towards the, the, the trail. Now, you know, I had to be careful that I'm not drinking my own Kool-Aid in these situations, but uh, it's intriguing uh, when you have unexplained phenomenon uh, in the forest. Uh, I've seen so many things in the forest they have really quite simple explanations. 
you know, wind or, uh, you know, who knows, maybe a porcupine climbed a tree and it, and it was just not strong enough to take its weight and it snapped over, you know, or a bear wanted to get the, the, the spruce tips at the top because they're sweeter and tastier and so it broke it over. It's tricky. Uh, again, you look for patterns though. Of course, patterns can be confusing too. In my experience as a naturalist, I can't really argue that weather or animals have caused these half-broken trees, especially when they seem systematic. Only human hoaxing is an answer, but not in the areas where I find them. These signs, if they can be called that, show up again and again, and curiously, only in places that are claimed to be hot spots for Sasquatch. Curious and curiouser. And that's what I was always trying to do, make sure that I didn't fall prey to my own, uh, as I say, uh, drinking my own Kool-Aid, uh, power of suggestion sort of thing. Uh, but I would always try to step back, look at the big picture, and, and just, you have to rule everything out. You know, it's like, uh, well, it's like that scene in Walter Mitty, Secret Life of Walter Mitty, where uh, Kristen Wiig talks about, you know, you have to look at all the clues and work backwards. I love her. Funniest actress. And, uh, oh, just, you know, I have a huge man crush. Not a man crush. I have a huge crush on Kristen Wiig. It's said that Who simply doesn't? walking the forest awesome. roads of Sasquatch territory at night is a good way to experience an encounter. And that's my plan. I'll simply use myself as bait. Night's coming oh, in. it's not that I'm tough or anything like that. It's just that, you know what? I've got faith that I'll be just fine. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've run into enough wildlife in my life, big game, and uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm just stupid, but I think... You're, if you're there with the right kind of attitude, it uh, makes a big difference. We have many miles to walk. Thankfully, it's on a, on a dirt road. We're going to be spooky. Yeah, Max and I made a mistake on this one. This is the walk back from the creek area where the shot, the film of Patty was shot. And this is this big, long walk back. And... Yes, I actually saw Max just uh, just last week, and I, and I said, you know, we made one mistake. We should have stayed overnight, right down by the creek. But when we went down, we didn't go down prepared at all. Uh, and it was pouring, pouring rain so much. And I was like, oh, let's walk back. So we walked seven miles down, and then we had to go seven miles back uphill. And that's what this hike is right now. And uh, I, I wish to this day, though, that we'd stayed there overnight. I mean, we still went on to have some crazy experiences, as you will see. Yeah. If there's ever a time to have a Bigfoot encounter, it would be right now. It's been a few hours of hiking back up the hill, quietly, on a dirt road, in the middle of a Bigfoot hotspot. If we see one now, we're only going to see a silhouette, so hopefully he'll stand close enough that I can film him with a night vision camera. This is creepy. See what I can see, which is not much. Because we're in the dark, pretty much almost. I'm walking in a thick, thick blanket of fog. I mean, it doesn't get any better than this. Beware the moors and stick to the road. Movies and TV shows create an unrealistic, fearful image of the wilderness. Whether shrouded in mist and darkness or lit by bright sunlight, nature is where we all come from. Sasquatch, or Oma, the traditional Hoopa name, may represent our link to the earth itself. Now, that is not a thing. Look up Sasquatch names, and there are dozens upon dozens of them, more than a hundred. Uh, Oma is the name here. Uh, uh, Siba, I think it is northern uh, Manitoba. And, uh, of course, Sasquatch. And, and it just goes on and on. So why? Why do those names exist? Why is there over a hundred different, na different names for a big hairy man that lives in the woods? Sorry, big hairy species. Let's get that uh, correct right now. Why? If there's no such thing, why do these First Nations peoples who, who in many cases did not communicate to each other, 
did not interact with each other, why do they have the same lore, the same stories, over and over and over again, describing the same being? I guess they're all delusional too. Most native cultures don't fear Sasquatch. They respect them. That's a great drone well, shot right there. About midnight, my dogs were barking like heck, and uh, I just figured it was a bear again, so I took my 22 with me, walked outside. By the way, if you want to see this whole interview, skip over to the playlist, uh, Survive Man Bigfoot. Uh, there's two Survive Man Bigfoot playlists. Uh, I think one is, says, like, the series, and the other one just says Survive Man Bigfoot, and his whole interview is there for you to watch. And um, my dogs were literally lined up side by side, looking up in this tree, barking at this thing. He jumped right in, into my light, right into my light. He didn't look at me, but I seen his whole body, kind of a, a reddish, brownish color, kind of like a orangutan color. Man, I'm thinking in my mind, what the hell was that? Because it wasn't a bear. It jumped out of the tree. Bears don't jump out of trees. They crawl down. I never did say it was Bigfoot, but what the heck else could it have been? You see what I mean? Now, what do you want to do? You can call him a liar if you want. Uh, he did not get paid for this interview. Uh, he really didn't have anything to gain for it. He's not done anything else to gain from his story. It's just his story. And uh, pretty salt of the earth guy. So you have to kind of take it for what it is. Let it be what it's going to be. Half the people watching this right now probably believe in ghosts or angels or demons or God or Satan. And yet, something that's been bantered about for hundreds to thousands of years and shows up time and time again in historical references, oh, no, 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 that's a bunch of bullshit. They don't exist. So, what are you going to do? Call all these people liars, I guess. Over the years, thousands of people have recognized the big difference between what they've seen and a bear. Broad shoulders, jumping out of trees, running on two legs, staring them down with a human face. That's another thing. I know on the Joe Rogan show, he, he did some stuff. He showed uh, bear, black bears running on two legs. Yeah, but you can still tell it's a black bear, you know, and, and sure, they do it for a short distance. But the stories of something huge and hairy running on two legs are vastly different by description than seeing a black bear go 60 feet on two legs. Completely different. When you waddle, oh, 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 right? They're just waddling like that. That's a lot different than what people see when they, when they tell their stories. Sorry, Joe. You know, a lot of times the question is asked, even if there was some sort of bipedal ape slash humanoid big hairy creature how could it live out in the bush and escape our detection i mean we're out there all the time aren't we don't we have roads and logging and things going on but you know what look behind me see that area that's one valley of tens of thousands of valleys that look just like that throughout north america could something live out there there was an intelligent creature who wanted to stay hid and could survive off the land and all it has to offer. Yeah. I could survive out there. And so could a lot of other creatures. Boy, I look so young there. But the catch here is the term intelligent. It would need to have a level of intelligence that is far more than most of us are ready to even consider. Because if it was nothing more than an upright walking ape, well, my opinion is, yes, we would likely have one in a zoo. There has to be something more to them. Exactly. If it's just a big ape, we'd have one in a zoo. They'd be shot and stuffed and all the rest of it. There has to be something more to the phenomenon. The burden of proof rests on the shoulders of those who claim that these creatures exist doesn't rest on the shoulders of the skeptics. So think of it like someone coming to your, your door and claiming a new religion. The burden of proof is on their shoulders, not yours. That's why if there is 
something that needs to be studied. It's got to be studied by people with the skills and expertise, the motivation to study it scientifically and not with junk science, with real observation-based science. That's what's required here. Yeah, who's going to do that, though? Then perhaps people will take the subject matter seriously. Yeah, look at that shot there. It was way off into the forest there. I mean, that's another thing. Like, you know, where is there room for them to, su to survive? Well, if you're asking that question because you live in Chicago and you never see the outskirts of the city, I understand why you'd ask that question. Come on out to the wilderness. There's a lot of wilderness out there. Even given the logging and the mining and the roads, there's still a lot of wilderness out there. That's why there's so many ex-convicts out there that are still evading the law because once they learn how to survive in the woods, they've got lots of places they can be. And yes, ex-convicts can also be uh, something that causes various things that we think are Sasquatch. They, you got to throw that into the mix as well. That is a black-tailed deer and prime prey species in this area. Anything that's big enough and strong enough and fast enough to take one down, and they go, is going to consider them prey. And just what would a Sasquatch eat? Well, according to researchers, Good question. just exactly what makes sense. Wild edibles, berries, fruits, nuts and seeds, mushrooms, deer, elk, squirrels, rabbits, pretty much whatever a bear would eat. Right. I mean, just put some common sense into it, common wilderness sense, if you will. Again, not knowing what the species actually is, but assuming that it is biological and needs to feed and eat and defecate and procreate and all the rest, then what's out there to eat? Well, all of those species and fish too. I should have put fish on that list as well. Uh, makes sense. And if they're super, super stealthy, powerful forest creatures, then they catch what they catch. They dig up what they dig up. They pick what they pick. And the Hoopa area is incredibly rich with plant life and food sources. You think Just in Vancouver, Vancouver Island, for example, every part of the season is a wild it's the place. island of blackberries. Mm. You can't live off of just blackberries. And they're delicious. But you can fill this up. The whole valley is just covered in berry bushes. And so you've got a season upon season upon season where different berries like these are wild grapes and blueberries and blackberries and gooseberries. Whatever's here, they'll all come into their own at different times. And if you're a large creature and you just want to pig out on berries, this is the valley to do it. No wonder there are so many bears here. Now, they don't hunt the bears in the Hooper Reservation. That's another reason why they're here. But the main reason is to eat food like this for a long time, you get big and fat. So anything as big as a four to 650 pound bear can survive here. There's got to be some serious food around. 650 pounds, I'm probably Must pushing a bit. Oh. I found this load only yard. Let me stop that right there. Uh, 650 pound, I think that's actually like the maximum record bear. I could be wrong about that. Maybe somebody can post about it. The maximum record black bear. And I think it was in Manitoba, about 650. So uh, I should have probably held that to about uh, 400 pounds. And then I found this poop on the road. This was the freakiest thing. It's from the wild grapes. And it's far too big to be human. If there is such a creature, a Sasquatch existing in significant numbers in this area, as the residents believe, then this big pile of poop could actually be Sasquatch feces. Well, it kind of could. So don't, so stop laughing. It was probably black bear. It's just, it was really weird on the road and it, it just didn't look like bear poop at all. And it was massive, right? So uh, if I remember correctly, I did take a sample of it and then the sample got kind of, um, what would you call it? Destroy it, and it just—it didn't—it didn't—I didn't keep it properly. Yeah, that's why I wanted to show that quickly in the show. But uh, I did take a sample of it. It just didn't keep properly, and there was no point in doing any kind of DNA test with it by the time I'd sort of gotten it home, if you will. Yeah, you see that in my carry-on luggage? Yeah, I don't mind, as I got some Sasquatch poop with me. In 
In Northern California hides a small community, a native territory called Hoopa. The residents here claim they live amongst beautiful wilderness, wildlife, and Sasquatch. This area up in here, right over here, this is the site of a fairly incredible story. woman up in here alone. She looked out her back window and saw what will only be described as a Bigfoot, a large, hairy creature. With one in each arm, he had some of her bags from, from that, that heaping pile of shed there. And she, she noticed him. She called the cops. The cops came right away and as they came back here, right where I am right now, I'm looking at the forest here. They said they could feel the ground shake with each step that the creature took. One of the police officers drew his gun, came walking into here, stood right here, right where I'm standing right now looked down into here and said he was overcome with just an intense feeling. It was, it was the, the, the creepiest, scariest feeling that he'd ever had in his life, the hair up on the back of his neck. One researcher asked him, well, did you, did you look up? And uh, he said, I didn't want to look up. And those were the haunting words of a police officer. It's a good story. Again, we're talking police officers now. Right? So, uh, was he lying? A trusted member of the community. He's far from alone. There are many others with stories. Yeah, I was scared of it. But what are you going to do? You're going to start running, running to where? There were tracks there, Bigfoot tracks there. And them, them, uh, some hunters went up there and turned their hounds loose on this. One of the dogs got killed. There was some bite marks on it, but more or less twisted and torn to. That one always freaked me out the most when the guy goes, basically he's talking about his dog. His dog was twisted, torn in two. And again, that guy has nothing to gain and nothing to lose. We just heard he had a story, reached out to him. He agreed to talk to us, and that was the end of it. He didn't get paid for that. And, uh, man, I'll forget. I, I, I remember that one. That was a, that was, I just can't get that image out of my brain of them going off to see their dogs uh, being grabbed by a, a big, hairy beast and being twisted and torn in two. Think about that when you go to bed tonight. I had a really close encounter when I was um, seven years old, right here on this. So this is Inker, but I see my tape's about to run out, so hang on, gotta switch the tape. On this flat, one night I was going to the bathroom at nine o'clock in the evening, and our bathroom was relatively small. But our window was like, you know, it's probably six feet up off the floor. I looked up into the window, and I seen this humongous arm reached right in, and it almost touched me. And the arm was this, I mean, it was massive, huge. And um, the skin was like, not a black color, but a really like, a really dark tan color. And I fell to the floor, and I, I, I couldn't holler. I was like, I was paralyzed. And I, I laid there, and and all of a sudden, I like, hollered for my, my dad, I, dad, dad, dad. And he come running into the bathroom. And he goes, what's going on, son? And he see me laying there, so he kind of picked me up, and I go, that thing tried to grab me, Dad. That thing tried to grab me. And so he runs back into the other room, and he hollers at uh, you know, my mom. He goes, Dicey, Dicey, give me that gun. He goes, my father ran from right here. He ran out to back here. He said he stopped, and he said he looked at this thing, and it was standing about right at the, that, that plume right there, that plume line right there. But it was, that was an old wooden plume line. It was all open where, you know, the irrigation used to go through there. 
And he said that thing turned and looked at him like that. And he cocked his gun. He said, by the time he cocked his gun, he said the thing was already down by the creek, he said, and it was running. Now, something that you hear over and over again is the, the speed is unbelievable when people have these experiences, that they can't fathom how this, this, these things can uh, move so quickly through the forest. So, you know what? I'm just looking. Oh, I hate when that happens. Oh, there's a moth flying around my candles, and it just committed suicide. Oh, no. There it goes. I hate when moths commit suicide. My fault for having the candles there, but his fault for being inside. If it's a he, I don't know. How do you tell the sex of a moth, anyway? If there's an entomologist out there, perhaps they can answer that question. But I digress. When Inker's speaking, you got to remember, he's relating the story from childhood. Uh, and again, he has nothing to gain from me. I didn't pay him, you know. He's not looking for notoriety or fame. And... It's one of those things where he tells a story as if it was just like yesterday. And how many of us have stories from our youth that we can tell as if it was just like yesterday? He said, it took one jump, and it jumped the creek all the way across up over top of the creek, one jump to leap that creek. And that creek is a pretty big creek. And um, it ran up the side right there. And by the time my father got there, it was already gone. Inker was a good guy, nice guy. What do you very, say to very... thousands of people? Credible, respectable people with nothing to gain and sometimes much to lose by coming forward and telling their stories of Sasquatch encounters. Are they all lying? Delusional? The continued and increasing eyewitness accounts are going to be a problem for the skeptics. But people make mistakes, imagine things, and once they become terrified, they can deduce that Bigfoot is the culprit. Inker was taught by the last existing Hooper shaman and he's my guide into the Hoopa territory, into areas considered to be sacred. And like so many natives I've come across on this quest to find the truth about Sasquatch, he reveres them, and he's in awe of them. Most North American native cultures are not laughing at Bigfoot. They're waiting for their return. Hmm. Yeah, that's the thing. You do run into difference of opinions amongst native cultures. Some do fear them, and they say, leave them alone, stay away. Others uh, would like the connection to happen again. Most of them, I think, actually, that I've run into say, you know, let's just leave them alone, you know, just stay away. Uh, but one way or the other, they all still don't question their existence or reality. Deep in the heart of the Hoopa Territory in Northwest California, I'm hiking the back roads and trails in search of answers, trying to find one more piece of the puzzle called Sasquatch. I started out looking for what I was told was a big ape. Now I'm not so sure anymore. I keep seeing uh, yeah, you know, I made that comment because I changed while making this series. You know, I went out looking for a big, smart ape, and I went through a metamorphosis from experience to experience to experience that was uh, led me away from that pretty quickly. And that's what you have to wrap your head around. If you keep thinking, oh, are they talking about a big smart ape? Well, we would have had one in a zoo. We You're right. That's why that's not what we're talking about. The tracks like this, huh? it's a relatively small track, so it could be just something from, you know, the boot of a human. But still, when you take a look at it and look at the shape of it, and, and I try and stand oh, beside it. I missed that hat. I, I lost that hat. Anchor gave it to me. Wet right now. So if there was ever a time I should be able to make a good, strong impression, it'd be right now. There's my, and there's the other. See, it's too close to tell. That's a good thing to do as well when you're tracking, is to try to make a track beside the track, and see how deep down you can get when you make that track. And if you, can, if you can't get down at all, then perhaps the track was made by either something very heavy or when it was raining, so it might mean that it's an older track, or maybe you can get down just as much as it. Uh, so something to do as well is to try to make a track beside a track, and that helps in the aging of a track. That really is probably just a boot print. It's just that it's got an odd curvature to it that uh, 
doesn't necessarily signify boot, but maybe it does. It's full on needle in a haystack when it comes to looking for it. So it's kind of like you gotta you gotta kind of jump into the haystack and hope that you land on the needle. So you just don't know how it's going to happen, when or where. That's the no, thing, no, you know, no. what? this whole phenomenon can't be forced. It, it's, that's what frustrates everybody. You can't force it. It either happens or it doesn't. It is or it isn't. It's going to happen. The possibilities are many. I stole that from Never Cry Wolf. It's that moment. You can feel absolutely fine the whole way. And you get this feeling that like something's watching you. So this next little bit here got pretty freaky. Max is with me and Inker. And um, it got strange. I saw, as I said, I saw Max last week and we, we actually remembered it and we talked about it because I'll get to it because some strange stuff happened that to this day we can't explain. Recently I was quite a long ways away from here in northern Manitoba, Canada, and there they call it Sabe. And Sabe. Sabe in northern Manitoba. The seven teachings that they have, each animal represents a different attribute. Perhaps one animal might represent courage, you know, that sort of thing. And, and there's wolves and eagles and bears. None of them are mythological. There's no thunderbirds. They're all regular standard animals that you have in the forest. Well, one of them is Sabe. It, right alongside wolf and bear, eagle, raven. And the teaching that is associated with Sabe is honesty. I find that interesting because for those people who claim to have seen a Sasquatch, they have to often say, look, I don't care what you think, I'm being honest, this is what I saw. Yeah, always love that, uh, the Sabe. Uh, and uh, Dave Cochin, uh, northern Winnipeg, nor northern Manitoba. Uh, that's their teachings. Is is uh, you know, say wolf means you know whatever courage, and beaver means you know whatever, and and El eagle means whatever. And then there's sabe, like in the middle. As I just said, there like it's in the middle of their teachings. It's in, it's in the seven animals, but they're all just animals that exist. There's no thunderbirds or crazy mythological creatures, just animals that exist. And in the middle is, is Sabe representing honesty. This is old teaching of theirs. Why is Bigfoot mixed in with beavers and ravens and wolves, and bears? I don't know, but they are. And let's get something straight, by the way. I still have people saying, well, where is he? Uh, with the thought that it's only one thing. This is not the Loch Ness Monster we're talking about here. Uh, we're really exploring something that people estimate could be as many from as, as, as five to 35,000. When I say people estimate, I kind of meant me. That's what I'm estimating. In the species. Others have said, no, no, they're like 65,000. But think about it. If there were 35,000 of these living in North America, but they lived in groups of 10, super smart, super stealthy, living in the forest. Well, there's 60,000 black bears in Ontario alone, you know, uh, and, and how many tens of thousands of mountain lions and cougar? You ever see one? You know, I've seen them. In fact, I bumped into a cougar once, but it's all incredibly rare. Now, if... Sasquatch species is only one twentieth of that. For the, all of North America, living in small groups and units that bury their their dead and communicate and are highly intelligent. That's how they could be out there. That's what we're talking about. So we're not talking about one creature here, one one guy. Oh here. yeah, that's the other thing is, if if you're stuck on like where is he or it's one Bigfoot, well that's that's. Once you get into the phenomenon, you get past that one real real quick. If you're not past it. Uh, I don't know, go watch TikTok videos or something. He's walking around, photobombing everybody. So, in case you were still stuck in that mode, now you know. For many native cultures, Sasquatch is a spiritual being and a real flesh and blood creature. 
It's both. But it's much closer to the human than an ape, with abilities beyond what most scientific researchers are willing to even talk about. I just want to talk about finding the truth. The whole thing is this, the whole point of this. Putting up with this kind of thing is to just simply stay in the area, to simply be in the area. The reality is you can't just come walking into some place for you to have Bigfoot sightings and see one. It doesn't work like that. You gotta come here and wait it out and see if they come into you. That's the only way. That's the frustrating part. You have to let them come to you. If they exist, you can't go find them. This tiny pond is a site of great spiritual significance to the Hoopa people. They often come here to do ceremonies and they feel they are never alone. The Sasquatch are said to be here with them always. There have been many reports of loud, strange screams heard here. So what are we talking about? An ape? A Neanderthal? A race of humans? Something paranormal? Quantum physics? Or just one big myth? Looking for answers is a slippery slope. There's an old adage, don't ask questions you don't want to know the answer to. As we work on shelters in the rain, Max and I find much of our camera equipment failing in ways we can't explain. Humidity normally just shuts things down, but our gear is malfunctioning in ways we've never seen. Many researchers claim that Sasquatch have the ability to affect electrical signals. And then, as if on cue, Inker comes running from the forest after hearing some loud knocking. So I have to pretty much just take Inker's word for it. I mean, it, yeah, there are big trees, and it is windy. And trees knock, and it sounds in the wind. Yeah, this whole circumstance was weird. You know, I, I'm, I'm happy to write it off to the storm. It's just, it was strange, you know, and... Was Inker playing us? Could have been. Could have been for sure. Uh, to what purpose? I don't know. Just to get a rise out of us and make it look funny on camera. I'm not sure. But he came running in and, you know, you, you look at somebody's face, you know. Either they're fantastic actors or uh, they really heard something. And uh, he heard knocking. And uh, this is me going over. Um, but I did hear what he heard. And just a single thunk kind of sound. And this is my style. You say there's something over there? Okay, let's go look. When Inker said he had that feeling in the back of his neck, I didn't, but I'm getting it now. <laughs> so, oh, I just walk here. That's pretty much where the sound emanated from. Our camera equipment continues to fail. This was the weird thing for Max and I. We've, we've had cameras in the rain a hundred times over, you know, and uh, they shut down from humidity. But we were getting these strange electrical interferences. That's what I will tell you. We'd never experienced before or since. While the knocking also continues, and in my mind, I'm deducing that it does in fact sound deliberate. But I'm refusing to believe Inker that it's not just a tree in the wind. Yet it sounds like something inside the tree, hitting the tree whenever I turn away. My ears can hear it, but the camera mics are not picking it up. Many of these cedars can be hollow from the bottom to the top. That's the thing, you know, these little cameras are not going to see things in the dark that your eyes see, hear things in the night that your ears hear. It's really tricky to capture a lot of this stuff on cameras. That's not an excuse, it's just technical truth. It's very difficult to capture a lot of this stuff. Uh, you can hear it, but you can put the microphone, and it's like, unless it's full on, doesn't pick it up. Same thing with seeing. You can see, put the camera, nope, can't focus on it. And anything large could live inside. Boy, did it rain. I'm hearing the knots all the time right now. 
I do admit it's a strange sound to hear. Wish, I wish you could hear the knocks. What are you going to do? You've got to take my word for it. I was hearing them. Uh, it was just, it was so windy and so rainy that cameras wouldn't pick it up. It was just made by the wind. There's all the rest of the creaking and the knocking and the banging. There should be lots. A lot of trees here. That's the end of that GoPro. This is really confusing. Because I'm walking closer, closer to the sound. And uh, I'm pretty sure it's this big tree. I'm not normally curious about sounds in the wilderness, but this one is different. Sounds hollow. Inker was so sure it was a Sasquatch. I just want to prove him wrong. That's what I like to do with all of this. Let me see if I can prove you wrong. Probably did the most of that with, yes, Todd Standing. So eager to see every tree break and every mark in the woods and everything. Every sound is another hoop by a Bigfoot. And um, yeah, I wasn't buying that in a lot of situations. And I said so on camera. And that's the thing. I like sort of getting involved with this. And, and, you know, if you invite me out because of your Bigfoot story, you have to be prepared for me to say, yeah, that's an owl. That's a raven, you know. Uh, and if I can't say that, I won't. But if I can, uh, then I will. That's a crazy thing. I'm hitting on this tree. I'm banging on it. It was making all kinds of knocking. I started banging on it, just like tap. I mean, my little hand hitting this massive tree. And all the knocking stopped. Wind was still blowing. Rain was still pouring. It should have just kept knocking if there's just like a natural thing going on. It just stopped when I was there. That's strange. This one's solid. That one's I can't hear another single sound of tree noises in the storm. Only the sound coming from the inside of this tree and the timing of the knocks sounds deliberate. And that was the truth. It was weird. It, it just seemed to react to me, you know, like I go over to it, it stops knocking. Stay there a long, long time. Go away from it, starts knocking again. I don't know. You tell me. The last act. For now, I've backed away from the tree knocks, even though they continue at what seems like deliberate intervals. We have more important matters our own survival on this small mountaintop. The rain is turning to wet snow at times, and without a fire, we'll have a miserable night. Yep, it was going to yeah, be the, miserable. The toilet paper's not burning, but. We needed a fire bad. It was one of the times, yeah. crazily enough, we weren't there for survival, but we were getting into a situation, Max, Inker, and I, where it's like, we need a fire, and we need it bad, or we're gonna be in serious trouble. It won't even burn. No tents. Wow. I don't know, man. I know they want us here. It's not such a flippant comment after all. With Inker, everything in the wilderness is observed and accepted on a spiritual level. He believes we're being tested at a skill both of us should be very good at. And with the fire failing so much, and the relentless rain, Inker and I, and even my cameraman Max, are just thinking, let's get out of here. But our internal spirit is keeping us trying. Inker scrounges for dry material, but everywhere is drenched. This is where it gets weird. Both of our lighters are empty, and I'm running out of matches. This is indeed becoming a test of our character. 
really trying to be dramatic there at all. This was actually going on. It was like, man, we should just go home, but it's getting dark. And so, you know, we're kind of stuck here. Uh, and uh, it was a real test. Mm. You gotta be kidding me. Oh. And let's face it, I know how to get a fire going. With the tree knocking, still sounding deliberate and separate from the storm winds, continuing only a hundred feet away, match after match fails. And now I'm out and left with only a small bit of coal and no dry wood to add to it. But coinciding with our lowest moment emotionally. The reason why I'm even telling this story is because of what happens next. And seemingly in the nick of time, suddenly, only 50 feet from us, a massive tree falls down. It makes us all jump. Revealed in the tree fall is a huge supply of dry wood. So dry that it powders easily. It was raining so hard that water was bubbling up from the ground. That's how much rain was happening. And yeah, it's just conjecture, right? It's raining, so of course a tree falls down in the rain. It's rotting. But this tree fell down in the nick of time when Inker and I refused to give up. We were trying so hard. It felt like, being, like we were being watched with that knocking. And this tree falls down and provides for us all the fire we need to get warm and dry and get a fire going. With the new dry wood, I'm finally able to coax out flames. The wind continues, as does the rain. But the tree knocking stops the second I get the fire to take. Is that drama? Dramatic storytelling? Sure. But it is what happened. All the knocking stopped. Though the wind stayed the same, the rain stayed the same as it had been for hours. I get the fire going and the knocking stops. Inker has his own perspective on what just happened. <laughs> Inker's thoughts are that the creator working in tandem with Sasquatch observed us in the testing and blessed us, gave us an opportunity to survive. It's the kind of perspective that requires an open mind and a big picture view of the circumstances. Individually, many events don't seem so special. But when you string them together, only then can you see a connection. Kind of like it's a conspiracy, right? If you look back, you can see the thread through everything. When you're in them, you can't see them. And there's a lot of that when it comes to this phenomenon. It's the kind of stuff that I can't really talk with Joe Rogan about because Joe wants, he wants to be hit on the head by a Sasquatch, right? So if you start talking about subtleties, whoosh, it's, it's, it's gone. He, he, he doesn't have time for subtlety. And no offense, Joe, but you got to slow down and really deal with the subtlety to see what's going on out there. And when, we, when Max and Inker and I step back, step back and look at all of this, you have all these things, you piece it together, and it's either silly conjecture or something. The dangers of hypothermia. Two skilled bushmen can't get a fire going, and so we're tested. A test of our character to not give up and just go home. There are strange, deliberate sounding tree knocks from the moment we arrive. And suddenly, as if we had proven ourselves worthy, a big pile of dry wood is dropped at our feet exactly when we needed it. The second the flame becomes strong enough to hold, the knocks stop, even though the wind and rain did not. And our cameras? They malfunctioned only from the moment we arrived at the lake, and then they began to shut down, only to work perfectly fine the next day. You do the math. Are all these events connected, and do they hint towards something spiritual or within the realm of quantum physics when it comes to Bigfoot, or just simple coincidences due to weather and therefore meaningless? Inker doesn't think it was all so meaningless. In fact, he believes the whole affair was full of meaning. What it all does mean will be revealed 
when the puzzle is completed. That right there is what Max saw on his camera. And I will say again, we never had any camera issues before or after, but right then and there, all through that, the cameras were going crazy. So, if you put all of the anecdotal references together, you get the conspiracy answer. Uh, all I can say is, well, that's what happened. Uh, why it happened that way? Who knows? Purely coincidental. Uh, or maybe... Hmm. Or maybe not. But right now, I'm alone in a little cabin on my third glass of wine, having watched this freaky version of Survivor Man Bigfoot. And uh, I have to go to bed. Wish I wasn't alone. <laughs>